Well, I'd like to welcome you to week 10 of Science Fiction. This is Professor Ellis. I uh, hope everyone is doing well, that you're staying healthy, uh, that if you're getting a chance to get uh, your vaccine shot, that you're taking advantage of it. I'm still trying to get an appointment. Um, but continue to wear masks, uh, practice social distancing, all the things that can try to keep you know, ourselves safe, our family safe, and of course, um, the city from going back into another wave of the virus. Uh, we have to all kind of um, pull together and contribute to that effort, right? So do what you can. Um, now that we're in week 10, uh, we're going to begin with new wave science fiction this week. Um, and during today's class, I've uh, got um, a few things we need to go over. Uh, I just want to remind you all, make sure you have your notebooks out while you're listening to the lecture so that you're making good handwritten notes. Um, those will be uh, what I collect at the end of the semester for your second set of notes. Uh, contribute a huge part of your grade because I really um, think that note taking is important. So I want to reinforce that by not only requiring you to do it, but then also you know, giving you a grade on that effort that you put in to making those good notes. Because I know that you will learn and remember that material better that you're making notes on. Also keep in mind that um, you should be working on your research essay at this point, um, that you should be using the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction that I've mentioned before, that you should be using that handout uh, on science fiction definitions that I've uh, shown you before, like in the beginning of the semester, and I gave you a link in last week's lecture uh, post on Open Lab, and that you should also be using the library's databases. Uh, in particular, look at Academic Search Complete, uh, Gale One File, uh, JSTOR, Project Muse. These are places where uh, people are publishing peer-reviewed research on science fiction that you can incorporate uh, as supporting evidence uh, for some of the things that you want to discuss regarding the different topics that you've selected for your research essay. Um, I can't remember now with our class if I had mentioned this, but you can also get um, a free subscription to the New York Times uh, digital subscription. What's great about that is you can search its archives and you might actually be able to find some research that way as well. To get that free New York Times uh, digital subscription, all you got to do is go to nytimes.com slash passes. And when you go to that website, you want to click on create account. And then it's going to um, ask you for your email address and create a password and some other things to create an account. Make sure you use your City Tech email address because one of the benefits that you have as being a City Tech student is you get a free digital subscription to the New York Times, the newspaper of record for the United States of America. So use your City Tech email address so they can verify that you are a student here and then you will automatically be able to get that subscription. And once you've logged into nytimes.com, the website for the New York Times, you can go into um, the search feature in the upper right hand corner, this little magnifying glass guy, and then you can type in uh, different search terms. So like if I just want to search broadly, science fiction. You can see here Ted Chiang, the science fiction writer. Uh, here is um, one of the film adaptations of Philip K. Dick, um, rotoscope version of um, uh, film with Keanu Reeves. Uh, here you can see an obituary of James Gunn, who was very important, not only to science fiction scholarship, but also to the teaching of science fiction. This is his obituary. He died earlier this year. Um, so, I mean, you can find a lot of stuff also through nytimes.com. Um, and again, remember, with some of your topics that you've selected, some of the stuff is really brand new that you're researching, particularly with video games and maybe some recent films or TV shows, in which case there may not be research yet. And so you may have to kind of you think with your mind and also see what other people are talking about in relationship to what you've selected. And you might find some research on these tangentially connected um, films, video games, TV shows that you could then 
draw on that research say well this this researcher says this about this older video game and then what you do is say I am extending this I see that this also applies to this new video game that I'm talking about you're making those connections you're creating those linkages um, and so again the topic that you've selected it can be a book it can be a short story uh, it can be music, it can be art, it can be video games, it can be TV shows, films, everything uh, that is science fiction uh, or science fictional in some way is fair game. Uh, and I know it's getting very late in the semester, but if you haven't touched base with me yet about your topic, make sure you do that. My email address is jellis at cdtech.cuny.edu, and I'll get back to you with some ideas, whether you just say, like, that's great, run with it. Uh, but also if I can think of any research that might help you, I'll, I'll give you links to that or tell you how you can find those things. And also, I don't want you to get so deep into your research that you you find yourself in a place where you just think is a dead end. If you need to change to a different topic, that's also perfectly fine. Just touch base with me. Let, let me know what's going on. Uh, because again, I'm here to help you, even though we're not in the same place the, same, the way that we would have been when we were you know, teaching and learning on campus, doesn't mean that you, you can't like drop me an email or come by my Wednesday 3 to 5 p.m. office hours or arrange a separate meeting with me by email uh, so that we can discuss things just like we would have done when we were meeting on campus. Uh, so however I can you know, support you, all, all I need to know is that you need that help, that you need that support, and then I'll certainly give it. Because I want you all to have really outstanding research essays. Because again, you if, if you skipped over this part in a previous lecture, everything that I want you to be doing, I, I, I think about how it can apply to your future, to your work in the workplace, to your uh, personal life, and your ability to, to take part in business, and having acumen about uh, working professionally with others. And so everything that you do in the class, you can leverage in different ways. And in particular, the research essay automatically can serve as a writing sample. It could be something that you either include with job applications to prove to who you're applying to that you have communication skills. Because like you think about it, everybody that's getting this or applying to the same jobs that you're going to be applying for are going to say that they have good communication skills. What distinguishes the person that gets the job interview from the person that doesn't get the job interview is who can prove that they have those skills. And so just simply having the degree is not enough. You got to have other concrete ways of showing both you have the knowledge in your discipline that you're training for, but also that you have these other skills, soft skills, like communication skills. Um, you could also put up this uh, research essay um, on your LinkedIn.com profile. You can create a page for it and copy and paste it into that page. So there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of promote these things that you know how to do. Um, and I want you to be thinking about that in terms of the work that you do in our class. Um, because there's a transferability from what you do in a science fiction class where you're becoming a science fiction expert but all these different tasks that you're doing are not just intended to make you that science fiction expert those skills are transferable to other domains whether it be in your personal life your professional life etc all right um, and we'll talk about the final exam coming up but again that's going to be a take-home final exam you're going to be able to use your notes um, so it's very important, obviously, that you have good notes on these lectures so that you can take the final exam and do it as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible, so you get like you know, a really good score on it, and it's not something that's going to end up taking you like 12 hours, okay? If you do the legwork of having good notes, of you know, doing all the readings, you'll be prepared to knock out the final exam like that. Um, but if you don't do this legwork now, you'll have to do it later. And then when you do it later, you'll, there's always that chance you can make a mistake. And that, of course, will lower your grade on the final exam. So don't do that. Uh, so for the rest of class, we're going to lecture on New Wave SF. And then we'll discuss uh, homework uh, and uh, 
which will involve readings and the weekly writing assignment. All right, so before we get into New Wave SF, we need to set the stage. We need to look at the context for what's taking place uh, in the long 1960s. And again, just think about how this always relates to what science fiction is. Science fiction is an extrapolation. And if you think about the definition for extrapolation, you have a set of initial conditions or a starting point that you then extrapolate. You're looking at what might happen in the future. What are future possible results based on those initial conditions? And so if we're thinking about science fiction as produced in a particular historical era, a historical moment, then whatever's going on at that time is those initial conditions. That there's no constitutive outside to those initial conditions. That, that is the world we live in, and it's the world that the writers of science fiction were living in at that time. And those things will have informed and shaped those writers um, to do the kind of writing, to make the kinds of stories that they did. So keep this in mind. Extrapolation is always dependent upon those initial conditions. That is, essentially, science fiction is always about the here and now, both from our perspective, our here and now is like the way that we receive and think about these stories, but also the here and now of the writers and the authors, the directors, etc., cetera, uh, that made the science fiction. What was their here and now like when they made these things? So New Wave SF, make sure you get that in your notes, New Wave SF, that's like the era that we're dealing with, coincides roughly with the long 1960s. When we say the long of a particular decade. That means that the, the things that were taking place in a particular decade likely began a little earlier and also went a little over just that decade because obviously, you know, what's going on in the world doesn't start and stop at the beginning and end of a decade, right? Um, so we call this the long 1960s. Uh, this era is marked by radical cultural change, violent upheaval, political assassinations, political activism, and technological triumphs. If you can imagine, the 1950s were a time of conformity, patriotism, the nuclear family, reinscription of public and private gender norms, as well as an economic boom after the war. The company IBM Man is emblematic of this time, same suit, tie, shoes, hat, as everyone else. They look like little clones of one another. And in fact, they even have their own company songbook at that time that all the employees would have learned the words to their, their company songs and sing them together. So following World War II, which had sent women into the workplace while men were in the war fighting, everything got turned upside down. Uh, women went back to the home and men took back their jobs. It was, in a sense, things getting back to normal as they were before the war. However, the thing to keep in mind is that things now or then are not how they have always been. The shadow of the war and its effect on, war, on work, home, and individuals could not be erased, and they would lead, over time, to new changes. The 1960s are, in a sense, a reaction to the staid 1950s. Some call this time the swinging 60s, due to changing attitudes towards social taboos, including sex and drug use. The counterculture of the 1960s was an anti-establishment movement and a general attitude. It arose out of social tension regarding race, gender, sexuality, and authority. The years of the Second World War had opened new possibilities for many, and it raised questions about what had been considered normal and the status quo before. Why should women be expected to be homemakers? Why should blacks not have full voting rights and equal access to civic participation? Why should they have to sit at the back of the bus? Why should gays and lesbians be persecuted? 
These questions turned into calls for action as the 1960s unfolded. And so these are some of the things that took place in the 1960s that you should be aware of, that you played a part in all this. Inaugurated in 1961, Democratic President John F. Kennedy, a World War II naval hero, called on Americans to, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, end quote. In September 12, 1962, he started our moonshot program with these words at Rice University, quote, no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard." End quote. While Kennedy called for greater international cooperation and community, he was hard pressed to challenge the encroachment of communist regimes in nearby Cuba and in faraway Southeast Asia. Uh, the former culminated in the Cuban Missile Crisis and the latter with the Vietnam War. And then, tragically, President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. was a leading voice in the civil rights movement that had begun in the 1950s and continued into the 1960s. He brought Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolent activism principles from India to the United States. Among many accomplishments, King led the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott and helped organize the Selma to Montgomery marches in 1965. He delivered his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial during the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. In recognition of his work, he received the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize for his use of nonviolent resistance to fight racial inequality. And again, tragically, King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. On the heels of the Korean War, the Vietnam War ran from 1955 to 1975. The aim was to stop a domino effect of countries falling under communist rule in Southeast Asia. American involvement and in how the war should be waged was debated and protested. While American soldiers killed numbered 58,220, the total deaths for all feeders in the conflict are unknown, but estimated to be between 1.4 million to 3.6 million casualties. Ultimately, Vietnam fell to communist forces and remains a communist-led country to this day. Now, there are also other tragedies uh, in the world at this time. And if you remember from the lecture um, on the Golden Age and thinking about World War II and the Holocaust, you know, one of the calls after World War II was that this should not happen again, that, that there were calls to make sure there wasn't a genocide on the scale of the Holocaust possible uh, again. And unfortunately, this just simply wasn't the case, that the time after World War II, there was um, more killing, more deaths. Some of these mass deaths that followed uh, in the years after World War II and leading into the 1960s including, included man-made famines, such as Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward from 1958 to 1962 in China, that led to the deaths of 30 to 55 million people. And then there were the killing fields of Cambodia, where genocide by the Khmer Rouge eliminated about a quarter of the population, or 1.5 to 2 million deaths. And this is at the tail end of the long 1960s, between 1975 and 1979. In response to uh, you thinking about um, things that were also taking place in terms of you know, fighting injustice, in response to a police raid on the Stonewall Inn in the early hours of June 28, 1969, the spontaneous Stonewall riots served as a touchstone for the gay liberation movement in the United States. 
This date is memorialized by the first gay pride marches in 1970. There were some hopeful developments during this era. The Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968, the latter signed by then President Lyndon B. Johnson during the riots that followed Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Uh, these were signed into law. And the U.S. space program, which had begun in the 1950s, successfully landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon on July 20, 1969. Then in culture, the British invasion began with the Beatles' arrival in the U.S. in early 1964. Bob Dylan and others led the folk music revival as a counterculture movement. Music festivals like Woodstock in 1969 also combined the counterculture with music and mind expansion with drugs and free love. New sounds came from The Doors, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, The Velvet Underground and Nico, and The, Be and the Beach Boys. Important films wrestled with larger changes taking place uh, in the world, uh, but you know, specifically in the United States, uh, including Easy Rider, The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, In the Heat of the Night, Midnight Cowboy, and To Kill a Mockingbird, based on the um, novel. This is also the era of the French New Wave of Vadim, Truffaut, René, and Godard, as well as the Spaghetti Western. In science and technology, automobile culture hit its zenith in terms of production by the U.S. Big Three, uh, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. And the birth control pill is introduced in 1960, and the measles vaccine is delivered in 1963. Cosmic background radiation was discovered in 1964, which provided support uh, to the Big Bang model of the universe. And in 1967, the first pulsar, or rapidly spinning neutron star, was discovered. The first laser was invented in 1960. The first industrial robot was introduced in 1961. The first computer video game called Space War was created. The first geosynchronous communication satellite, meaning a satellite that remains fixed over one place above the Earth, is launched in 1963. And this idea was popularized by the British SF writer Arthur C. Clarke uh, in years um, prior. The first ATM, you know, getting cash out of machine, was opened in London in 1967. And then for many of you that are studying um, information technology and computers, definitely should know about this. Douglas Engelbart. Uh, E-N-G-E-L-B-A-R-T. Douglas Engelbart's Mother of All Demos took place on December 9th, 1968. And it demonstrated all of the fundamentals of modern computing that we take for granted today, including um, graphical user interface windows, hypertext, graphics, video conferencing, the computer mouse, word processing, dynamic link, uh, dynamic file linking, uh, revision control, and collaborative real-time editing. Also, the precursor to the internet, known as ARPANET, went online the year after in 1969. And our smartphone cameras and webcams have AT&T Bell Labs to thank for the charge couple device, or CCD, which was invented in 1969. Now, there are several events that we can point to as being the end of the long 1960s. The Beatles break up in 1969. National Guard troops open fire on peaceful Vietnam War protesters with live ammunition at my alma mater, um, Kent State University, on May 4, 1970, killing four and injuring nine. And then U.S. President Nixon resigns from office in disgrace on August 9, 1974. So this sets the stage for New Wave SF. So the origin. The term New Wave comes to us from film criticism. It is a translation of the French Nouvelle Vague, 
which identifies the experimental cinema of Jean-Luc Godard, Francois Truffaut, and others. And I should note that Godard and Truffaut made films that were science fictional or had science fiction elements, including Alphaville by Godard and Fahrenheit 451, a film adaptation of Ray Bradbury's novel uh, by Truffaut. Another important short film from this movement is La Jetée uh, in 1962 by Chris Marker, which is composed entirely of still images with a voiceover uh, that tell the story of a time traveler after a nuclear war who remembers his own death as a child. Um, Terry Gilliam's Twelve Monkeys from 1995 is inspired by Marker's film. So this is, those films are th from the 60s were all part of this French New Wave. The term New Wave also refers to punk music's ascendancy, like its rise, around 1977. New Wave was first applied to science fiction by Christopher Priest, P-R-I-E-S-T, the British science fiction writer uh, who's uh, well known for writing The Prestige, which was also turned into a film. Uh, to describe the kind of writing appearing in the magazine New Worlds, which you can see here on the screen next to Michael Moorcock. So what's this about New Worlds? New Worlds was a leading UK science fiction magazine. Things changed when Michael Moorcock, um, who was born in 1939, assumed its editorship in the May-June 1964 issue probably make a note of that, May, June 1964 issue of New Worlds. Moorcock was as polemical and leading as Campbell had been with astounding, but to different ends. Juxtaposing fiction with factual social commentary, visual collage, and even concrete poetry in a deliberate attempt to lose the genre science fiction image and to place speculative fiction in a context of rapid social change and radical art generally. In Moorcock's first editorial, he called for a new literature for the space age in the tradition of William Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-U-G-H-S. You might look him up. Moorcock is also an important science fiction writer who based much of his writing on the concept of a multiverse, a panoply of parallel universes, each slightly different than the next, and each protagonist, like the main character, eerily similar yet different. The protagonist is the figure of the eternal champion, E-T-E-R-N-A-L-C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N, -E -E eternal champion one whose task is to combat chaos on behalf of order. Those characters around the Eternal Champion have more ambiguous goals. The sword and sorcery character Elric, E-L-R-I-C, Elric is a significant Eternal Champion. Moorcock also created a figure paradic of the Welchmerts, one who knows that reality cannot satisfy the dem demands of the mind. Uh, that word is a German word and it's spelled W-E-L-T-S-C-H-M-E-R-Z, Welchmers. One who knows that reality cannot satisfy the dem demands of the mind. So this anti-hero Elric is called Jerry Cornelius. C-O-R-N-E-L-I-U-S, an anti-hero aping the pop colors of 1960s swinging London. Cornelius was an anarchic streetwise urban ragamuffin with James Bond gear and immorally deft at manipulating everything from women to the multiverse itself. Moorcock made Cornelius an open universe or a universe that others could write about and create new stories within. Uh, one of my friends uh, named Carter Kaplan, 
uh, K-A-P-L-A-N, uh, published his own Jerry Cornelius novel with Moorcock's blessing. So even though uh, Moorcock didn't have a hand in writing the story, um, he did give his blessing to Kaplan for writing a story using these characters in that open universe. Now, the idea of New Wave SF spread from the United Kingdom to the United States. Judith Merrill, the U.S. Canadian science fiction writer and editor, wrote about it in her anthology, England Swings SF, from 1968. Probably should get that date. England Swings SF, published in 1968. And remember, an anthology is a book that is a collection of stories. Um, or it could also be a collection of articles in the terms of scholarship, but in this case, this is fiction, um, short stories and novellas that are published together as a single book, but all of the different stories are written by different people. Judith Merrill acts as the editor for all of those writers whose stories appear in the anthology. It was difficult to get some of the new wave published in the big science fiction magazines here in the U.S. So Harlan Ellison promoted the new kind of science fiction in his groundbreaking collections Dangerous Visions, 1967, uh, which include 33 influential stories, including Delaney's I and Gomorrah, which we're going to be looking at later, and again Dangerous Visions from 1972, which included 46 stories. A third installment uh, has yet to be published, and I, I don't know if, if it will because unfortunately Ellison passed away a few years ago. Resistance to the term New Wave SF by so-called New Wave writers and the science fiction old guard um, did present some problems. Nevertheless, the movement did open up the genre for new stories and new ways of telling stories. It revitalized the science fiction genre from its straight-jacketed, golden age, hard SF focus. So what are some characteristics of new wave SF? I have them up here on the screen. Five characteristics that you should know about new wave SF. One, belief that science fiction could and should be taken seriously as literature. And that when I say literature, I mean like literature that you would learn in an English class. The stuff that is prized and valued um, by, say, English professors and people that are in the intelligentsia. Uh, in the past, science fiction was looked down upon. But the new wave SF people said, you know, we can make science fiction just as good or better than all that really fancy literature writing. And so that's what they set out to do. Two, writing experimentation and better writing. So, I mean, if you're going to make something that's going to be treated as seriously as literature, <clears throat> you need to uh, make the writing better. And so there was writing experimentation, like using new techniques, techniques that were uh, innovated uh, during uh, earlier uh, literary movements, particularly the 20th century and modernism. So writing experimentation and better writing overall. The third characteristic is inner space. I-N-N-E-R-S-P-A-C, inner space. And this tends towards psychology and the soft sciences uh, as opposed to hard SF. So inner space involves psychology and sociology, anthropology, uh, all the sciences that are focused on human beings rather than always just focused on physics and chemistry and biology, the hard sciences. Four, shared qualities with late 1960s counterculture, including mind-altering drugs, oriental religions, violating taboos, market interest in sex, strong involvement in pop art and in the media landscape generally, social change for equal rights and protection under the law. 
So all of these things that encapsulated the 1960s counterculture got brought into uh, science fiction via the new wave. And then finally, pessimism about the future, especially the near future. Uh, this takes two major forms. Uh, one is a belief in the likelihood of disaster uh, caused by overpopulation uh, and ecolog e ecological collapse or war, as well as a cynicism with United States and United Kingdom politics, particularly United States involvement in Southeast Asia and the Vietnam War. So there's this pessimism about the future, whereas we look back to the pulps and the golden age, the future was seen as full of possibilities, that it was just going to be great uh, for everybody. But you know, with uh, New Wave SF, they were like, you know, here we are in the future of our past and things haven't got any better. In fact, they've probably gotten worse in a lot of ways. So how are we supposed to think that just automatically the future is going to be great? It's not. If we want a better future, we have to build that better future. I mean, that's like the ethos of um, the political side of the 1960s counterculture. So let's talk about some of the major writers. Uh, we're going to go over some today, and some of these will carry over into next week's lecture. Uh, first off, we have J.G. Ballard. Make sure you get his name just like this, J period, G period, Ballard, B-A-L-L-A-R-D. And he was born in 1930 and died in 2009. J.G. Ballard was born in Shanghai, China, uh, and spent childhood as a civilian in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And in fact, he wrote about this in his 1984 novel, Empire of the Sun, which was adapted into a very popular film by Steven Spielberg in 1987. Really great film. I highly recommend you seeing it. It's not science fiction. It's really about him being a child in this prisoner of war camp. Um, J.G. Ballard discovered science fiction during uh, Royal Air Force flight training in Canada. Uh, his work is characterized as written in an experimental style and focused on psychology and in the emotional significance of deserted landscapes and wrecked technology. He said that his focus was on inner space, where we get this term from. A couple of works I want to mention um, that you can put in your notes and maybe look up on your own. There's, I mean, he's written a lot of things, but these are just two um, that I think are very emblematic of New Wave SF. Uh, the first is called Crash from 1973. And this novel took uh, J.G. Ballard's obsession with automobile accidents to a logical conclusion. Uh, and you could call it an example of pornographic science fiction because the obsession with automobile accidents for the characters in the novel is like uh, or is akin to um, being titillated by like essentially being turned on by automobile accidents and it explores the psychological satisfactions of danger mutilation and death on the roads and it examines the interface between modern humanity and its machines. The second work I wanted to mention is from 1970 and it's called The Atrocity Exhibition. A-T-R-O-C-I-T-Y The Atrocity Exhibition and it uses the cut-up style of William S. Burroughs, the name I mentioned earlier. Definitely look up William S. Burroughs, a uh, very important writer, uh, who also did a lot of experimental stuff like this cut-up style, where he's literally cutting up words and letters and reassembling them into these um, montages. Uh, so the cut-up style of William S. Burroughs. The chapters of the Atrocity Exhibition are composed of condensed novels or shorter segments connected by titles 
that make up a running sentence. So like if you take the titles of all the different chapters or condensed novels, they turn, they create a, a sentence themselves that tells a little story. The protagonist shifts from story to story with a slightly different name. So it, it is making the reader work a lot to try to figure out what's going on. Some chapters include plans for the assassination of Jacqueline Kennedy, love and napalm, export USA, and why I want to fuck Ronald Reagan. The U.S. publisher actually had the printed copies destroyed after an executive learned that JFK, Marilyn Monroe, and Ronald Reagan were characters in the novel. And uh, one of the stories um, that uh, I have had students read in the past that I didn't include on our syllabus that you might want to take a look at is called Cage of Sand and it first appeared in New Worlds in June 1962. Cage of Sands, worth checking out. Now I've mentioned um, this writer and editor several times in past lectures because you know, he, he did have a, um, a strong presence in the genre uh, for a very long time. Uh, and that's Harlan Ellison. Make sure you get his name right, H-A-R-L-A-N, Harlan. Ellison, E-L-L-I-S-O-N. And he was born in 1934 and died in 2018. Harlan Ellison's work focuses on ethics, human courage, and often the city. Uh, he specializes in the short story uh, as well as in screenplay or script writing. And I should note also, like on this photo here, this is my, my photo that I took of Ellison uh, at uh, Dragon Con. It's a huge science fiction and fantasy convention held in Atlanta, Georgia every year. Uh, and I think this was from 1998 uh, when I got a chance to uh, meet him there. And so one thing I, I should also point out that if you're interested in science fiction, you should you know, keep a lookout for conventions because this is a time in a place where like-minded individuals want to get together and uh, talk about and enjoy science fiction. You know, we have, um, you know, the New York Comic Con is one of the local venues. Uh, there's also local science fiction uh, fandom and fan conventions that you can attend. Um, it, they're really fun and exciting to, to go to and you can meet some really cool people there. So I highly recommend you, you um, explore some of those possibilities and they're all over the place so even if you don't stay in New York you'll be able to find a science fiction convention somewhere near you uh, in the United States uh, over the, over each year. Now Harlan Ellison uh, is characterized by Robert Silverberg uh, an important name you might want to make a note of and look up later R-O-B-E-R-T Robert Silverberg S-I-L-V-E-R-B-E-R-G Robert Silverberg characterized Harlan Ellison as insecure, physically fearless, extraordinarily ambitious, and hyperkinetic, dominating any room he entered. Much the same could be said about the short stories which made him famous, winning eight Hugo Awards and three Nebula Awards. Ellison is also the 23rd Grandmaster of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association of America. Harlan Ellison is also rabidly um, assertive of his rights and the rights of others. However, he can be mean, rough, and rude when cornered or on the attack. For example, he sued James Cameron successfully to have screen credit for the 1984 film The Terminator, which he argued successfully was based on the Outer Limits episode Soldier and possibly Demon with a Glass Hand. Both of those screenplays were written by Ellison. Now among his exploits, which I think is interesting for those of us here in Brooklyn, is that while researching his first novel titled Web of the City, published in 1958. Um, 
he basically hung out with a gang in Brooklyn's Red Hook. Um, so, I mean, if you'd imagine this, you know, he's from Ohio originally, but, you know, he took on like the swagger and a Brooklyn accent and essentially convinced these, these gang members like he was one of them and was able to run with that gang for over a period of months, gathering his research uh, to write a novel that really conveyed what it was like to be in a gang in New York City around um, the 1950s to the early 1960s. Additionally, he marched to Selma with Martin Luther King on March 7, 1965, otherwise known as Bloody Sunday. He covered the race riots in Chicago in the 1950s with James Baldwin. He uh, ghosted uh, the then relatively unknown Lenny Bruce's column in Playboy in the Playboy wannabe magazine called Rogue. He got fired his first day at, as a writer at Disney when he was overheard by Roy Disney, Walt Disney's brother no less, uh, suggesting facetiously a Disney porn movie. Uh, and providing sample dialogue in Disney's characters' voices. So you can imagine this did not go over well uh, inside Disney, so he got canned. Um, while attending a science fiction convention in Phoenix, um, he did so in an RV, refusing throughout his stay to spend any money for food, water, even electrical hookup in the state of Arizona because this le legislature hadn't voted to approve the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which was put forward in the 1970s um, and failed to get enough signatories from states uh, to be ratified to the Constitution. But it's something that hopefully one day we will get added to the Constitution. Look that up if you don't know about that, the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, this is something to put in your notes. This is the big year for Ellison, 1967. Okay, his big year. Three big things happen. First, uh, he edited Dangerous Visions, one of the most famous science fiction anthologies, and, and it's like the, the touchstone for New Wave SF in the United States. Dangerous Visions was published in 1967. He also published two of his most successful stories in 1967. Uh, one being, I have no mouth and I must scream, which is about an artificial intelligence uh, that tortures the last remaining human beings alive on Earth. And the story, Pretty Maggie Money Eyes, uh, about a poverty-born beautiful girl who becomes a prostitute to escape poverty. Her soul gets sucked into a silver dollar machine. She then uh, gives wins to a guy down on his luck only to trick him into exchanging his soul with hers, uh, ending it saying, heaven or hell, it doesn't matter, free. And then the third big thing that happened is his teleplay, meaning as a screenplay for television shows, his teleplay for Star Trek called The City on the Edge of Forever was broadcast. However, many people, including Ellison, felt that the manner in which the teleplay was produced simplified his complex and darker vision. Uh, but the program remains, nearly you know, 30 years later, the best known and best episode of Star Trek. Uh, the inter and what it's about is the Enterprise crew discover a time portal called the Guardian. Uh, Dr. McCoy slips through and accidentally changes history by saving a woman's life named Edith Keeler. Had she died, she would have um, led a pacifism, uh, had, she not, had she not died, she would have, uh, not, I should say, had she died, she would not have led a pacifism movement that prevented the U.S. from getting involved in World War II. Uh, in which Germany would then be able to develop its own atom bomb and win World War II. So Kirk and Spock have to go back in time following Dr. McCoy 
to set things right. But what is right in order to make history turn out the way it actually did is that Kirk has to kill or allow this woman essentially to die. Uh, it's a very gut-wrenching episode and that's what you know, I assigned on the syllabus if you can get an opportunity to watch it. Um, there's a lot of you know, places that you can find it to watch online. Um, and if you don't have direct access to it, ask around friends, family members. Um, and if you look on the syllabus, I gave a link about how to find different places, uh, legal places to watch it. Um, but you know, I'm sure you're all resourceful. You can find a way to see that episode for an up upcoming class when we're going to talk about Star Trek and we're going to talk more about that episode in particular. Now, two other stories I want to mention about Harlan Ellison um, that he wrote. Uh, one is called A Boy and His Dog, and it's from April 1969. A Boy and His Dog is about Vic, who's a young man, and Blood, his telepathic dog, uh, in a post-apocalyptic landscape where there's not many women left. Blood helps Vic find women, and Vic helps Blood by giving him food in exchange. Vic uh, finds, uh, oh, Vic gets captured while tracking a girl and then later escapes confinement with the girl. Blood, who had been injured, needs nourishment in order to heal. So, what do they do? Uh, the boy uh, decides to kill and cook up the, his new girlfriend in order to um, help his beloved pet dog, a boy's dog. It's also got turned into a film, um, which is is interesting in its own right uh, to watch uh, from, the, um, I believe, the 1970s. Uh, then a uh, final story I wanted to mention uh, that we read for today's class uh, is "Repent, Harlequin," said the TikTok man from 1965. "Repent, Harlequin," said the TikTok man. And make sure you look at the title as it appears in the text uh, that I linked to to make sure you get the, the spelling and the punctuation correct. And of course, the, being a title of the story, it should have quotes around it. Repent, Harlequin, said the TikTok man. So this is about a dystopian future where time is regulated and you must follow a strict schedule. A man assumes the anarchistic Harlequin to rebel against the timekeeper known as the TikTok man. The Harlequin is captured, rehabilitated like Winston's myth in the novel 1984, um, which you, George Orwell's 1984 is a very important work, um, both for literature in general as well as science fiction. And if you haven't read it, you should check it out. So look that up on Wikipedia just to get a sense of what 1984, the novel, is about. But Ellison is taking that idea and applying it um, to our world, uh, or the world that you know he was experiencing from the staid 1950s going into the 1960s, where things are becoming more um, um, directed top down. Uh, there's an expectation of conformity. Well, here you have the Harlequin fighting back, um, but then once he's captured, he become he's rehabilitated, like you know, reprogrammed, uh, and then he repents in public. Um, and I should say that, you know, again, looking at Ellison's litigiousness, like his likelihood to litigate when he was alive, a film in 2011 called In Time was released, which borrowed some of the, this idea of like, you know, um, you know time regulation for people. And he actually sued, uh, but then he eventually dropped the suit. And up next we have Philip K. Dick. So make sure you have in your notes his full name. Uh, normally when we write his name, when we're talking about him as a writer, you should use it the way it's on the screen here. Philip K. Period Dick. Uh, and he was born in 1928 and died in 1982. Very easy to remember because you can transpose those last two digits 
and get his birth date and death date, 1928-1982. But I want you to know also his middle name, just for your own um, knowledge. Maybe a question on Jeopardy one day when you're on on TV. Uh, His full name is Philip Kindred, K-I-N-D-R-E-D, Kindred Dick. But whenever we write about him, it's Philip K. Dick. So Philip K. Dick lived most of his life in California, but he did spend a short time in Vancouver. Most of his life was spent in California. Uh, He was a uh, serial groom, we might say. He was married five times and had three children. He wrote mainstream novels and short and long form science fiction. Uh, But most of his mainstream novels appeared after his death. Only one was published while he was alive. And when I say mainstream, these are like realistic stories, ones that don't involve science fiction ideas. Uh, Philip K. Dick uh, wrote at a mad pace to make money, which was always tight for him. At times in his life, he relied on amphetamines to fuel his writing speed and stamina. Uh, For example, he wrote 24 novels during the 1960s. I mean, that's all as an unheard of pace for anybody. Five of those were written in 1963, and six of those were written in 1964, uh, one of them being a collaboration with the science fiction writer Roger Zelazny. Uh, Philip K. Dick gained far greater fame after his death than during his life, unfortunately. Uh, but you that fame. Uh, led to him being the first science fiction writer to have his work published in the prestigious uh, Library of America series. Uh, He was the first science fiction writer to appear there. Now there's some characteristics of his work that I'd like you to put in your notes and I have them on the screen here. Uh, First, his work often involves ontological problems. When we talk about ontology, Uh, This is a term that comes to us from philosophy. Ontology involves our sense of reality, our sense of being, and also the idea of authenticity, like what's real and what's fake. So his work is full of these types of ontological problems involving the nature of reality, the nature of being, and the nature of authenticity. Second, They also involve epistemological problems. And make sure you spell this correctly in your notes. E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. Epistemological problems. In philosophy, epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's like, what do we know? How do we know it? How can we verify that we know these things? So these ideas of like, you know, what is knowable, what's not knowable, how we know things, these are also problems that he uh, in, you know, interrogates in his work, epistemological problems. A third characteristic is entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. And you, from your chemistry and physics classes, uh, you should know that the universe is entropic, meaning that you know, things tend to uh, go toward a disordered state that you know, we have to put energy and work into things to make them ordered. So the universe is entropic and humanity can only slow down but not stop the force of entropy. That's a big concern to Philip K. Dick in his writing. Uh, fourth characteristic is empathy. Empathy. And the way that he deals with this issue of empathy is in the images of the android and the human. And what he writes about is that sometimes it can seem that the android, which should not have empathy, could in fact have empathy while the human doesn't because the human being has become more like the android, become more robot-like. And so there's this concern on Philip K. Dick's part about our loss of uh, empathy for others, our concern for others, um, caring about others' hardships. This is a big issue in his writing. He feels, obviously, that we should be concerned about the well-being of others. 
A fifth characteristic of his work is religion. Religion is a big part of Philip K. Dick's writing. Specifically, Gnosticism, uh, that's spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, and to a lesser extent, Asian religions. So Gnosticism is about um, secret received knowledge from like you know, a um, godlike source. You know, it could be God, it could be like an emissary of God, like an angel or something like that. Uh, but like this secret knowledge that we can obtain uh, from a divine source, Gnosticism. And then his preoccupation with Asian religions was also, I think, emblematic of just the 1960s in general. People were searching for answers, and there was this influx of books and writing about uh, Asian religion, uh, religions, everything from like Confucius beliefs, Taoism, um, Buddhism, and other, other belief systems uh, that people in the West uh, just you know, devoured. They got really into these things and, and they inspired Dick in a lot of his thinking as well as a lot of his writing. And I think this culminates in one of the works I'll tell you about in a minute with his 2374 event. This is an event that took place in his life in February and March of 1974 that culminated in his writing the Vallis Trilogy, V-A-L-I-S Trilogy. And then finally, uh, the final characteristic is called the little man. Um, the Dickian hero, uh, D-I-C-K-I-E-N, that means a hero that Philip K. Dick wrote, Dickian hero, uh, is a normal person. They could be technicians, it could be a record store clerk, it could be a salesman. Uh, these are just like everyday average people, not supermen. Uh, which is like one of the funniest things about some of his the adaptations of his films, like you know, with the first Total Recall from 1990. You have Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, playing the title role uh, of the of of Quaid in in the story. Uh, that is not a little man <laughs> in the Philip K. Dick sense. Um, so his heroes are just normal people. So there's a number of important works by Dick that I want to tell you about before uh, we talk about what you read for today's class, <coughs> The Electric Ant. So you can list all these. You don't have to go into all the details I give about them, uh, but you can you know, look some of these up on your own if you know, some of his writing or some of the films based on his writing um, you, you sound interesting to you. Uh, so one is uh, called The Man in the High Castle, which is now being turned into an Amazon um, streaming series. The Man in the Ca High Castle is from 1962. And it's an alternate history, meaning, you know, where I was saying earlier that you know, science fiction is based on extrapolation, that you have these initial conditions based on our history that we then extrapolate and imagine future from. In alternate history, you go back and change some of those initial conditions to something else. So the man in the high castle is about an alternate history in which the United States lost World War II and the U.S. has been divided between Germany and Japan. And it involves uh, some you know, Eastern religious thought in this book, inside the book, called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy which is based on the I Ching, or the Book of Changes, um, related to Taoist uh, belief systems. It's like a system of uh, divination. I mean, like we use the system to like be able to uh, read the future, to like understand things that we don't have direct access to. Um, it's a very interesting story, uh, The Man in the High Castle. Then there's the Three Stigmata, of Palmer Eldritch, E-L-D-R-I-T-C-H, from 1964. And uh, Palmer Eldritch is a space explorer who returns from Proxima System with three stigmata. And your stigmata is like you know, uh, signs of you know, divinity. You know, if we think about like you know, Jesus Christ on the cross, he has these stigmata when he returns uh, from you know, when he's resurrected. So Palmer Eldred has these three stigmata, a robotic hand, electric eyes, and steel teeth. 
and he essentially kind of invades people's consciousness uh, through this addictive drug um, called uh, Choosy that he's able to get people hooked on. Uh, then in 1966, uh, Philip K. Dick published Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Uh, and what's great about this novel is it's full of ideas, much more so than uh, the Ridley Scott film Blade Runner from 1982. Uh, definitely you worth reading, but it, it's, at its heart it is about a bounty hunter who is trying to retire or uh, kill escaped androids. Uh, these are androids who have their consciousness essentially raised. They realize, hey, we are slaves. We want to return home and meet our maker. Um, and as a result, when they break loose, you know, they're like, they do kill human beings in order to affect their escape. So they're wanted individuals at that point. But because they're machines, they're not seen as human beings, but there's questions raised in the story, like I mentioned before, about empathy. The bounty hunter, Rick Deckard, seems to become more robot-like and uncaring, uh, while the androids, in their own way, in certain regards, uh, show empathy toward one another. And so who's really more human here? And that's the question for the reader to answer. Uh, then in 1977, Philip K. Dick published A Scanner Darkly. A Scanner Darkly. Again, you, you see these conjuring images of religion here, of like you threw a glass darkly from the Bible. Um, and in this case, the story is about a narcotics agent, Bob Arctor, who wears a scramble suit to hide his identity um, from everyone, including his superiors. That way he's totally undercover. On assignment, he becomes addicted to this drug called Substance D, which causes a degeneration of his corpus callosum. That's the connecting tissue in your brain between your two hemispheres. Uh, the drug like, breaks that down. And when it does, his identity separates between Bob, the narcotics agent, and Fred, his undercover drug user identity. And then there's Vallis, V-A-L-I-S, from 1981. And this is a very interesting novel in which Phil Dick uh, is a character in the novel who writes about his friend Horse Lover Fact. Uh, and this is basically um, a translation, in a sense, of Philip K. Dick's name. Philip means horse lover in Greek, and Dick is the German for the word fat. So horse lover fat is essentially uh, Philip Dick. Um, and this horse lover fat character experiences the 2374 event that I told you about a moment ago, where he ha essentially has this vision in which he has information beamed into his brain uh, via a pink laser beam sent from a satellite in orbit around Earth. And it gives him all this you know, hidden knowledge uh, about religion. And in the story, um, you know, Phil Dick, Horse Lover Fat, and uh, these two friends who are based on Dick's real life friends, Tim Powers and K.W. Jeter, both of whom are science fiction writers too, uh, seek out this little girl who is in communication with the Vallis satellite. Um, and actually, just it's not coincidental, it's, I think, relevant. It shows the connections between all these different works. Vallis appears in an episode of Lost. So if you've seen Lost or want to rewatch it, you'll see it kind of in the background. It, it does play a point in showing like this, I, this inspiration, maybe, to the way uh, that, that TV series was made. Now, there's a number of popular movies that are based on Philip K. Dick's writing. Um, they include Blade Runner from 1982, Total Recall from 1990, it's based on the short story We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, uh, Screamers from 1995 is based on his story Second Variety, there's Minority Report from 2002, Imposter from 2001, 
Paycheck from 2003, A Scanner Darkly in 2006. Next, uh, from 2007, is based on The Golden Man. Uh, there's The Adjustment Bureau from 2011, uh, which is based on the story Adjustment Team. And then Total Recall was remade again in 2012. Um, in a really strange, bad way, it seems like to me, from uh, when, I, when I saw it. Definitely you're going to watch Total Recall. Watch the 1999. 90, 1990 version is much more close to the original story than is Total Recall 2012. Um, a story that I used to assign uh, to the class I'll mention is called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. Uh, and it's a, from the April 1966 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And it, it's a really... Um, neat story um, and it goes into uh, you know, much more detail and I think tells a more uh, complex story than what you see when you watch Total Recall the film. Uh, you know, it, it explores how does memory work uh, using technology to manipulate memory and therefore our sense of self and ethics and empathy and there's all these layers of unknowability there's epistemological questions for the character Quail like, you know, what are his real memories? Uh, and then also ontological questions for recall and the police who are discovering this hidden truth in Quail's memories about aliens and their promise to Quail for his kindness that he shows to them. And in this story, again, Quail is the little man who turns out to be the most important person on the planet Earth. Now, in today's class, I'd ask you to read uh, The Electric Ant, which was originally published in the October 1969 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, and it's about um, Garson Poole, who discovers that he's a robot with a human-like appearance, or what is commonly referred to as an android. Uh, following an accident that you know exposes like the wires and gears and stuff. Within his chest is a punch hole tape. Uh, and if you can imagine like older computers uh, before we had um, you know like magnetic memory storage of different varieties uh, or like solid state memory, uh, the the bits, the ones and zeros that are computed by the computer were stored on either tape or on cards where holes were punched to represent different values that the computer could then understand as either programs or data. So in this case, you know, he's using that same idea, but sh you know, imagining what that might work like or look like in an Android. So he imagined this um, tape and the punch holes on the tape correspond to like the instructions and the memories of Garson Poole uh, as you know, uh, a human being, uh, or as, as an android that's been programmed to believe that it's a human being. So by changing his tape, Garson Poole changes his reality. Because if you change the way your mind works, if you change your memories, there's no way of knowing that those things have been changed. Um, so like many of Dick's fictions, uh, Dick raises epistemological, like how do we know what we know questions, as well as ontological, or what is reality type questions. All right, so I just wanted to end class just to remind you all to be working on the research essay. If you're having trouble with your research or you just want to brainstorm things, you can email me. Uh, let me know what you found so far. Uh, I mean, you realistically, you shouldn't just like email me and say like, uh, I haven't found anything. Like, tell me what you've already tried looking for. What have been the dead ends? Because uh, that's useful for me to know and understand like what you've been trying to do so far, so that I can offer you some suggestions about different things to try in your research. Um, also, you can come to my office hours, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 p.m. The link is at the very top of our syllabus. Um, and then we can brainstorm and talk about things then. Uh, and again, um, if anything comes up, you know, as we get closer to the end of the semester, make sure you keep me in the loop about things. Uh, I certainly want to help everyone 
um, if you to to be successful in the class despite all the other challenges that we're facing right now. Um, so just looking ahead, next week I uh, need to read Samuel R. Delaney's I and Gamora and James Tiptree Jr.'s The Women Men Don't See, and then we'll lecture on those. Also due by next week, uh, your 250 word reply to the weekly writing assignment. Again, just you, your um, best takes on the lecture and the readings. Uh, show me that you're thinking about these things. Show me that you're paying attention. Um, again, this weekly writing assignment is a way to help you concretize, like make those memories, the things I want you to learn, uh, crystallize and permanent in your mind. And so by re-exposing you to these ideas from lecture to notes to the weekly writing assignment is a way to help you do studying essentially. Uh, so the work of the class is meant to help you remember these things. Um, and then again, dive into the science fiction definition handout. Go to the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction website. Uh, just search Google Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. It's going to be the first link. Uh, and then also use those library databases. Uh, Academic Search Complete, Gale One File, um, Academic One File, uh, JSTOR, Project Muse. All of them are going to have some resources that you can quote from. Again, uh, you need to include quotes with parenthetical citations and, and a list of those works on your works cited list. And remember, your works cited list should also include the topic, um, the subject of your paper. So, like, you need to look at just do a Google search: Purdue Owl. A, uh, I'm sorry, Purdue Owl MLA, and that'll take you to the Purdue Owl website that gives you all the information you need about MLA format. The Modern Languages Association format for your parenthetical citations as well as those bibliographic entries that go in the works cited list. But that works cited list needs to include what you're writing your paper about, so like the film, the TV show, the video game, the book, the short story, whatever it is, and then all of your sources that you're, do, you're finding in your research that are going to inform and support some of the things you want to discuss about your subject of the research essay. Again, my email address is jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Office hours are Wednesdays 3 to 5 p.m. Link is on the syllabus. Uh, so reach out if you got questions. Uh, stay healthy, mask up, get a vaccine, uh, maintain social distancing protocols. We want to try to get out of this pandemic as quickly as possible and if we're not all pulling our weight, we're not going to get there. Um, so do what you can to keep yourself and your family safe. And if you've got anything else, email me. I will, and I guess I will talk to you all later on. Take care.